contact with each other. So, uh, yeah, we'll give you uh, this uh, laser pointer with your name on it. Oh, get uh, out. So, wow. So My it's lightsaber. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you very much. I had great tomatoes this summer. Okay, so uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation. And I, so far, I, I love my visit. I came around noon yesterday, and I've talked to so many nice people. And I have such building envy; it's not even funny. I'm going to go back now to this crappy old 1960s wreck, and I'm not going to. I'm going to just be miserable. Thank you very much. No, no, this is great. And and I was just telling Hiro that uh, you know the uh, the sign of a classy department is when you have strawberries at your colloquium. So I. That's fantastic. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do, oh, here we go. Uh, the outline is sort of like this. I, I want to tell you what we did about 15 years ago because I think it it enabled everything else that that we've been doing since. And and the stuff that we've been doing since is is the stuff I really want to talk to you about also because uh, there's some cool things. So I two of these things I, I hope to get time to show you, and uh, and hopefully that'll uh, won't, I, I won't take up more time than I have. Don't worry. Okay, uh, I, I, Hira already mentioned that, uh, and I want to put in a, a plug for this, that the way I know both uh, him and George is that uh, we met through this research corporation thing. And I'm just bringing this up because if you're a young professor uh, early in your career, it provides uh, research funds uh, for people who, who want to combine teaching and, um, and research in a scholarly way. And it, it's a great organization. I, it's been a huge influence on my career, and so I just wanted to put in a plug for it, and I'm sure Hira will urge you to uh, apply for these things if you haven't already. Okay, so uh, like Hiro said, I, I used to do particle physics for a very long time. My, my last student graduated recently, and now I have a, a new student in education research, which sounds very, very different, but it's sort of what I've been doing all along in a way, but I've sort of been in the closet doing education research, and now I'm, I'm out of that closet, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be doing this stuff uh, out here. And so the, the, we have a really good group uh, at Illinois. In fact, it's interesting because most of these guys are ex-high energy physicists and uh, somehow drifted into this field, and, and we have a bunch of students and, and affiliates. So I just wanted to show you this to show you it's a, it's a pretty strong group. Oh. Okay, so I'm going to borrow from David Campbell uh, something that he presented when he talked uh, at an, a forum in, in the summer of 97 when he was describing what we were doing at Illinois, and, and he termed it parallel parking and aircraft carrier because it's like this huge operation and now we're making changes to it while it's in motion, okay? And so just to show you, I mean, it's, it's not so different from, from what you guys do, but it is pretty big, just like it is here. So as of yesterday, when I checked, uh, when I was sitting at the airport, the enrollment in our, in our intro classes adds up to over 5,000 students just this semester. Uh, the, the, the classes I'm going to talk about uh, are the calculus-based, the mechanics and E&M, these two right here. So we have a, a mere 2,000 students in those. Uh, this semester, and in the spring semester, it's even bigger, about 10% bigger. Okay, um, so the calc base sequence kind of looks like this. Um, the uh, 211, just in case I slip into jargon, is the mechanics, 212 is the E&M. They're four-hour courses. All the engineers, all the physics majors take it, and uh, most of the you know, chemical engineering and things like that as well, and uh, this, it sort of breaks out like this. I haven't included the summer, which has a few hundred more students in it. I'm not going to talk at all about the, the modern physics semester, which is the third one, because we haven't really attacked that one yet in the same way uh, <clears throat> with, with the modern things that we're doing now with pre-lectures. But of course, we're doing the same things there as back in 15 years ago. Okay, so a lot of students take it. Uh, but having said all that, it's a pretty, pretty traditional structure, just like you do here. We have lecture, we have recitation, and we have lab. Okay, nothing, nothing more than that. And... Um, uh, something that we did 15 years ago, uh, though, made a big difference in how these courses are presented and received by students and, and the university as a whole. So here's the idea. How it used to work. This is 1993 when I first got there. It was sometimes great, but sometimes awful. Okay? And, and the reason is very simple, is that it was sort of run on tradition. The lecturer owned the class, and you, the department head, would say, okay, you, you're teaching uh, Physics 106, which is what it was called at the time. Uh, you're doing it, and, and whoever he was pointing at would drop to his knees and say, no, no, why me? And then he would say, well, if you do it now, you won't have to do it for another 10 years. And you go, okay, fine. And then, because uh, it was such a, a hard job. It really was a, a very hard thing, because you had to sort of reinvent it every time you did it. And uh, 
the TAs were kind of left to their own. There was a discussion section, but they weren't given a lot of guidance from the, the department, and so that meant they worked on homework problems and things like that, which is what the students really liked. So it was okay, it was fine, um, but it may not have been the best use of their time. And the labs were very cookbooky and uh, a lot of grading of lab reports and things like that. The TAs didn't like it very much, and the students didn't like it because they had to write their lab reports after the lab was finished. So they had to do stuff uh, later. Okay, um, So nobody was happy. The lecturer didn't like it because it was really a, a big, big teaching assignment. Um, some people liked it okay, but I would say on average didn't like it so much. Students hated it because they could see that the lecturer didn't like it, right? Which, and, uh, and often the, the quality was a little uneven, let's say. And the College of Engineering didn't like it because the product was inconsistent. Sometimes their students knew this coming out, sometimes they knew that. And they also, they, their students complained. And so the college, I think, basically back in the early 90s said to the, to the physics department, you guys got to get your stuff together, you know, or else. Um, so that's, that was the, that's kind of, when I arrived on campus at just the right time, I was very lucky. It's not like I would have known to do this, but the department said, the department head, David Campbell said, hey, you, you get over here. This is what you're going to work on. And so uh, Gary Gladding and David Campbell uh, started to think of how to, how to really make this better. And so the big idea, which is obvious in hindsight, right, is that you don't let somebody reinvent it every semester. That's crazy. It's too much work. So we're going to really do it right once, and then we're going to keep that structure, and we're going to do the same thing every single semester. And if you get to teach this class now, you get to make little changes, but you can't change everything. So that's, that's the big idea. Um, <clears throat> the same number of faculty are required to teach it in the new way as in the old way. In the old way, you would typically have this one professor who was in charge of everything who was dying, and you'd have a few faculty who needed plum assignments who would teach a few sections and didn't have to do uh, much else. Okay, So three or four people then, still three or four people now, you have a couple of lecturers, and you have somebody in charge of discussions, somebody in charge of labs. So the, the lab faculty, he is in charge of all the lab TAs and does a weekly training with them. Discussion faculty, same thing, and the lecturer delivers the content. Um, okay, so administration is kind of now shared. It's not so bad at all. Uh, you meet with the TAs once a week. Uh, you coordinate everything so it, you make sure you see it in class before you see it in discussion and homework. Everything is, is timed perfectly, and everybody works on exams. All right. So the big payoff to this approach is that the existing infrastructure now lowers the bar, so anybody can, can participate. You don't have to start and do everything on your own. Um, this is now a reasonable teaching load. In fact, it's a light teaching load. Brand new assistant professor comes to Illinois, has to set up their lab. They have a bunch of money to spend. Big hole in the basement where their lab's going to be. You stick them in this class because they have free time. So it's considered a light teaching load. That has a second advantage because now a year or two later when that person moves on to teach more advanced you know, senior quantum mechanics or something, they take with them the stuff that they learned. There's a lot of little teaching tricks uh, like just-in-time teaching, stuff like that that I'll mention that they can use in their, in their senior or advanced classes than they do. Um, so that's what I just said. So this enables innovation now because if you don't have to spend all your time running just to keep ahead of the tiger chasing you, then you have some time to pull up your socks, think, hmm, what could I do that's different that might improve something? And so that's, that's how these improvements happen that I'm going to tell you about. Um, pains and gains are shared, so now you don't have to have heroes anymore. So the idea is, I mean, ideally, you'd like to be able to stick anybody in these courses, and they'll do a great job. Now, there's some people that refuse to teach in these courses, but it's just a few. Most people, I, I would say everybody who has taught in these courses has, has had a good experience, and they, they would do it again. And so it's uh, no burnout, no heroes. It doesn't kill you. Um, the material is the same every semester, which means that uh, the students see the same thing. When their friend took it last semester, they didn't see anything different than they see this semester. The College of Engineering knows that when they graduate and they take TAM 212 or whatever, they're going to understand statics the way that they think they're going to understand statics. Uh, and so this is all good. And so this makes it uh, sustainable now because you have something in place. It's there. Every semester is sort of copied and is there again. And so you don't have to... You don't have to, it's, it's easy to sustain. People want to sustain it. You'd be crazy not to because it would be a lot of work. Okay, so that's kind of the, the big, very quick uh, five-minute rundown of what happened um, 15 years ago. And so I'm just going to show you a big table here. Uh, you don't have to read this whole thing. But there's many parts of the course, and I'll, I'll mention a few of these in a second, 
so the lectures went, and some of the stuff you're going to say, oh, I don't like that. But so the lectures went from being sort of transparencies, if anybody knows what that is, I don't know, uh, uh, to sort of PowerPoint. Uh, uh, we went from three 50-minute lectures to two 75-minute lectures for scheduling reasons. Um, in discussion now, very different than before, and I'll mention what that is in a second. I'll show you a picture. Same for labs. Uh, the homeworks are now done online. Uh, exams are multiple choice. And you can ask me about that later. It's not as bad as you think. And, um, and TA instruction, TA training is a very big part of all this. Okay. So discussion sections. Two hours a week, the students sit in a group of uh, four. There are six groups of four in a, in a room, so we have 24 students in one of these discussions. It's the same numbers that you have here, except you have four groups of six, right? So we just permute the two. And, um, and so they, we give them a problem to work on. And it's, it, I'll show you an example of the problem in a minute, but they're not that easy, and they have to just reason their way through it. Uh, <clears throat> here's a question right here. You see a hand going up. Here's a TA on the way. This TA will go over there and say something like, hmm, let me see your free body diagram. They won't say, well, here, the answer is whatever. So it's more of a, a dialogue. So the TA guides. So it, it's, it's really hard to TA these classes. You need to be well trained. I, I have a very hard time doing that. I always just want to tell people the answer. So it's, it's really hard to do this. But we train these people, and they're very good at it. OK? And so here's kind of the big idea. It's uh, these context-rich problems that we started with were first developed at the University of Minnesota, I believe, by Ken Heller's group. And they, they kind of look like this. So the kind of problems that this guy might be looking at there might look like this. You don't have to read it. The point is, there's no pictures. There's just a couple of numbers. You have to read it a few times before you even know what it's asking. Right? You have to discuss with the people sitting next to you, what does that really want? What do I know? What, what could we draw? Right? So it's not obvious what it's asking when you first stare at it. You have to think about it for a while. And so that's the kind of problems that we have them work on. And they do that for an hour and a half, and then we give them a quiz. That happens every week. All right. Uh, labs. <clears throat> the idea here is not now that you, you set up an equipment and make a measurement and propagate errors. That's the way it was, and there's nothing wrong with that. Error propagation is stuff now we do in our more, uh, more advanced classes. Here, they're supposed to uh, make a prediction, and then they're supposed to make an experiment, and then they're supposed to explain what they saw. So that's the idea. And the nice thing that the students like is that when they leave the room, they hand in their lab report. It's more of a check sheet than it is a really detailed report that they have to write. Uh, and so they're done when they leave, when they walk out. The TA gets this thing, and it's an easy grading assignment because it, it's just more or less a check sheet with some pictures that the student had to draw. So it doesn't take them that long. So the, the workload on everybody is less. I would still say, however, that the labs are the weakest part of this whole thing, and I'll get back to that. All right? Now, I just want to show you what happened when we did this. So this is all back 15 years ago. So this is still pretty ancient history. So before we did this, and this is why I said that sometimes the course uh, wasn't that great, when you look over here, this is a, the, the axis is funny, and I apologize, but this is the way that we have it. So good is to the left. And this is because we, we pull the students, and we just ask them, uh, how do you feel about the, uh, the course? So enthusiastic, positive, neutral, negative, and awful. Okay, We ask them after the course is finished. Oh, actually, be before and after. So before the course, this is what they're feeling is that's the blue. After the course um, <clears throat> is the red. Okay, So you'll notice that they're kind of optimistic beforehand. But then it sort of shifts over to the awful side after. OK? That's just how it was. Um, <clears throat> after these changes, it was kind of the opposite. I mean, people didn't know what to expect. So they, did, they had a sort of bad expectation because of history. Uh, but now most of them had uh, an enthusiastic or positive experience. OK, so these look like, I mean, it really meant a lot. This is a huge thing. The College of Engineering was very happy with this. Another thing that was really great is that the local newspaper, so every semester the students rate, there's a lot of rating that gets done. They rate their TAs, they rate their professor, all these Scantron sheets they fill out. And so um, they, the, the local newspaper publishes a, a list of people who were rated excellent by their students. And historically, physics TAs and faculty all lumped together would figure out about 20% positive, 20% excellent. After we did just these changes, it went to almost 80% consistently. Okay, So the students are now just happier with the course. So that's what this means. All right. So before I show you the really good stuff, I just want to make a, a point here. Okay, 
there's a challenge to doing this in our department, and as it is anywhere. Um, you need faculty to buy into something like this. And so what you have to sort of realize is that w when you're doing something like this, you're walking into something that exists. It's no longer my lecture is the course. Now, the course is there, and I'm kind of visiting it. I'll drive it for a while. Okay, then I hop out, and, and Hiro drives it for a while, and maybe each of us makes a little improvement, but we don't make a big left or a big right. Okay? Um, now, how do the lectures fit right now? I mean, is it really ever my lectures that define the course? Okay? Well, you might think it is, because here you are. If you think of how much time you as a professor spend on a course, you spend a lot of time preparing for class, right? A lot, a lot of time. And then you make exams and, and you do other things too. But what do the students see? Okay? Well, if you're lucky, if the students go to every single lecture, probably 15% of their time of course stuff is in the lecture, right? It's not a majority by even a, a, a long shot. Uh, what about evaluation? How much of their grade comes from lecture? I bet you in most courses it's probably zero. I put in 5% here because people are starting to, to have ways of, of having students interact with clickers and so on, but it's very small. What a student sees is, oh boy, exams, big deal. Uh, homework, labs, discussion, pretty big deal. Lectures, not a big deal. Okay? And so you don't, you don't want to build a whole course around the lecture. You want everything to kind of fit together. That's, that's my message. Okay. Um, <clears throat> All right, so here's the paradigm shift. And I'll, I, I have I a conversation with a reluctant professor, and I've seen this conversation with Gary Gladding, who had to convince people that this was a great idea. So reluctant professor, I, I won't, it won't be my course anymore. I won't, uh, I won't be mine. What am I going to do? Gary, well, this is good. You won't have to do it all by yourself. Okay? Uh, but I like to do stuff my way. Well, you can still do it your way. You just can't wreck it. Okay? <laughs> um, <clears throat> So what's in it for me? Well, time. You have time now. So the way that we get people interested in teaching this who are reluctant, we go, well, just try it. Just try it. You can change whatever you want. You know, they can't really, but you know, here's the PowerPoint slide. You can change. They don't change anything usually. Little things here and there. They personalize each lecture maybe a little bit, but they don't change much. They don't spend a ton of time on it, and they love it because they don't have to change things. Things are already really good. Okay, so that's the payoff. So infrastructure is the key. The other thing, and this is a quote by Gary, <laughs> people who create reform are usually not the same people who enjoy making their trains run on time. So you have a bunch of creative people come up with great ideas. Well, how do you, what happens when they leave? Okay, or do something else, or teach quantum when they get tired of teaching this? Well, I, again, if you have an infrastructure all set up, it doesn't matter. They can come and go. Everybody adds their little spice to the stew, and then they leave, and it's okay. So that's the key. It needs departmental commitment. You have to set this stuff up. Okay? But as a department, uh, you have to realize that this doesn't cost you any more. Okay? The cost per student of teaching this way is not any higher than it was before. And this way scales a heck of a lot better when you get more students. Okay? So that's my pitch for doing what we did. Okay. Now, I'm probably preaching to the quiet. Now, I showed you this before, but I'm going to use this as a motivation now to show you the, the cool stuff that, that I think you'll enjoy. Okay. So, now we have all this free time. What are we going to do? Right? We, we have time. We don't have to spend all day creating lectures. Now we can innovate. We can try other stuff. So what's left to do now? It looks pretty good, right? Things are, students like the course. Everybody's more or less happy. Even the college likes us. Um, well, we discovered that students are not reading the textbook. It's not an amazing discovery. I think probably you've noticed the same thing. We ask our students, and this is what they tell us. It's pretty amazing. What you see here, if you can't read the words on the bottom, we ask them, uh, how often do you read the text before attending class? This is the never. This is the rarely. This is occasionally, regularly, always. Always is there. Okay? We assign reading before every lecture. They buy this book for $140, and they hardly crack it out of the shrink wrap. Okay? And it's not that they're bad people, of course. It's just that they're really busy. They're taking 18 hours of math and physics and chemistry and everything else, and they probably say, well, I'll do it later, and then later doesn't happen. Okay? But this is a bad thing, because what it means is that when they walk into my classroom, I can't assume they know anything. I can't assume they've seen stuff. It means that I, I kind of have to um, <clears throat> teach from the very beginning. I have to assume they don't know anything. I have to start at the, at the, at the beginning and, and derive everything. Okay? And then... You waste a lot of time teaching stuff that 
they really should know coming in there, but they don't, and, and the good students are bored. Okay? And so uh, difficult material, the really interesting stuff that usually would happen toward the end of the lecture, you never get to it, and the students, if they're lucky, see the other stuff only once. So it's, it's a bad situation. Um, okay? So here's the new approach that I wanted to and I'll show you a little movie clip here in a second. Uh, <clears throat> new approach to lecture. So now, instead of just saying, please read something and then and come to class, uh, we now make the students do something before coming to class. Well, we know they don't read the book because they tell us, and if we, we can't tell if they did or not because the book is not electronic. Well, wait, maybe it is electronic. So we made an electronic book, basically. I'll show you an example of this in a second. These are called pre-lectures. So these pre-lectures introduce all the concepts that we're going to do in class that day, they do it before class. And so we know they've done it. It takes them 20 minutes. Okay? Just in time teaching comes next. So then we ask them some questions. They're still on their computer in their dorm room. And we ask them one conceptual question on each concept that we covered in the pre-lecture that we're going to do in lecture the next morning, and then ask them to explain their answer. So it t this takes them very little time, but it gives me something to look at when I prepare the lecture. So now I sit down the morning before class. My class is at at 9, I come in a little early, maybe 7. I look at their answers. I still I already have the, my lecture from last semester. It doesn't change very much. So I can, I can put in their answers. I'll, you'll, you'll see what I do here in a second. I customize the lecture, and then we go to class. And now the class consists of asking a lot of questions that focus on the stuff that they told me they don't understand. So this is a really big difference now. So the, the class is no longer deriving stuff and telling them stuff. I now assume they know stuff, and we discuss it. It's a very different atmosphere. I should say, this allowed us to cover more material in two 50-minute lectures than we covered in two hour and a half lectures before we did this. And we ask five, six, seven, eight clicker questions in class. All right? And the students think the stuff's easier. It's the same stuff. And it's the same people teaching it. So it's not like we have different people. Okay. All right, so let me give you an example of these pre-lectures. Instead of uh, talking about it, I'll just show you. If I can go here, go there, and go here. All right. So you're going to see Gary. This is the one my students are doing for uh, next week. It's a pre-lecture on relative and circular motion. And I'll just show you one minute of it. Uh, I, I kind of like this one. It's one I found this morning as I was playing around. Uh-oh. Go. Uh, do, 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 do. There we go. Oh, I don't know how to. It looks bigger than the screen, so I think my screen shrunk. But anyways, you'll get the idea here. Uh oh. Okay, so this is one slide of about eight. Each one is maybe two, one and a half to two minutes long. They together form what the student would have read in the textbook, introduces all the concepts, derives all the formulas, okay, and the students through this whole thing, there's a few questions that are embedded that they, they stop, they can't proceed until they answer a question, stuff like that. But it, that's, that's the basic idea. So it is essentially making them uh, read the text. Okay, so let me go back to the keynote. There we go. So you get the idea. <clears throat> um, so students do this, and, and this is what I just said. They do this instead of reading the textbook. We do not have a textbook in this class. All the students have to do these things. Okay, and they they pay for access to it. It's 25 bucks instead of 150 bucks for the text. That's it. All right, that's all they required. Now, of course, they ha they have to do this because uh, they get a very small amount of credit for it, but very small. They get two points out of a thousand for doing this every every lecture. Okay, but now every single student uh, regularly or always does this. So very few students don't do it. Okay, so now we know. 
when they walk in the room that they've seen what we want them to see. Next thing we do is we ask them some questions. So here, this is this just-in-time teaching. We've been doing this for 15 years. We didn't invent this. This has been done in other places. You may be doing it here, for all I know. Um, and so the idea is that you ask students before they come to class some questions, and then that tells you what you're going to do in class. That's the idea. And so uh, we, we, we check the knowledge beforehand. <coughs> Uh, these things that they do, they look at these questions online after they've done this pre-lecture, but before they walk into the classroom. I use these things when I prepare the lecture. Okay, It gives you buy-in now. The student has some something invested in the class. They know that I've read their answer. They want to know if their answer is right or wrong. We don't tell them if their answers are right or wrong until they come to class. They don't get points for getting off for getting these wrong. Just for, They get points for participating, so there's no real stake. They just have to do it. Okay, And it helps them prepare the lecture. Um, so here's an example. It's actually uh, it's 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 the classic one you know that we did when we did uh, high, static fluid. So here's an ice cube floating. The water is all the way up to the top. The ice cube melts. What happens to the water? Does it spill over? Does it go, the level go down or does it just stay even? And of course it stays even. Okay. Um, but what I can do is I can look at the students who said that it was going to spill over, and I can look at their comments. Here we go. All right. So I, I can select for A, B, or C there. I can see what their comments were. I can cut and paste those comments into the lecture. And, uh, and I, I kind of like these because here's a good one. The water level would rise. I learned that from Al Gore in Inconvenient Truth. <laughs> right? And so you, you get stuff like this all the time. And it's really great because then when I create the lecture now, and, and this, is, you know, this, is, this is a tough question. People don't get this one right. So it's a perfect question for, for doing before class and then in class with the clickers. So I say, OK, here are some of the answers that you gave for A, B, and C. I ask them to vote again. And now they have their clickers. And then they, they vote. And this is how they did basically before the class. So less than half of them um, got it right, or a little, just a little less than half got it right before. And then afterwards, after we had the discussion, they do much better. OK, that's how they do. And uh, so, so it's, a, it's a great learning moment. And then you can look for other comments so then people want to know, well, if this doesn't change the level, then how come the melting icebergs are bad and so forth? And so you can have a discussion about that if you want. It's very interesting. It's, it's great for sparking discussion in class. So that's, that's the checkpoint. Uh, in lectures uh, now, we, we, we do a lot of question asking. So essentially, uh, and this is Eric Mazur's thing, this peer instruction, this idea of having students discuss with their neighbors some question and then reporting back to you what their conclusion is. So we ask six to 10 of these clicker questions in a 50-minute period. We ask a lot. Um, <clears throat> okay, And so that's sort of the focus of the whole lecture. And it's great feedback for the students and for me. And I got to tell you this parenthetically, I've been doing this for a very long time. Before we ever uh, built the clickers, uh, we had flashcards and we had people stomping their feet or coughing. We had ways of trying to gauge if it was A, B, or C. And you realize very quickly when you ask students questions in your class and ask them to answer them, that they don't, often don't know what you're saying, right? So if you are students, pretend you're students. If I'm lecturing and I'm, you know, it's easy. You're in the front, you're on a roll, you're feeling good, you know. And then you look at somebody and they, they nod their head like this, and you go, you blah blah blah. You look over there, they're nodding their head, and you think, oh yeah, they're getting it. I'm good, right? And then you realize when you ask a question, oh my gosh, they're not getting it. I stink, right? I mean, it's a real rude awakening. It was for me, and so it, it's what started all of this education stuff for me was having this experience in my class. Because I realized, OK, I got to do better. I think that I'm doing a good job, but really, obviously, I'm, I'm not. So that was a huge thing for me, just, just, just so you know. All right. How does this impact our students? Let me show you. This is published uh, results. OK. So what we do in these checkpoints, we ask our students a lot of questions, very conceptual questions, and uh, before every class. And we have hundreds of these questions that they answer over the semester. So let me just give you an, advan or an example of one of these things. Here it is. It's just two resistors, <clears throat> skinny one, fat one, made of the same materials, they're the same length. The same current flows through both of them, right? So which one has the biggest voltage across it? So this one obviously has a bigger resistance, so you're pushing the same current through it, so you're going to have uh, more voltage across one than two. That's, that's the reasoning we want them to come up with. But it's a hard question. So only about half of them consistently get it right. Okay? This was before. We, we did anything. This was before pre-lectures. So when you see spring 06 and spring 07, they're really the same thing as before we, we tried doing this new uh, teaching technique. Um, <clears throat> all right. So on this plot, 
Here I'm plotting spring 06, spring 07. There's one data point, all right? And so it shows what students' performance was on this one problem before any of these changes happened. So then we can take the very same problem and we can compare. Basically, we just take the average of spring 06 and spring 07 and plot it on the x-axis. And now we plot the, the performance on that question on the y-axis after our revision. Okay, now, you, so we maybe we just gave it away, right? It could be, it doesn't prove anything, but then we stick every single question from the whole semester, and they're the same questions we've been using for 15, 20 years. Okay, looks like this. So you see a very tight correlation here where things don't really change from semester to semester before, but now things are mostly above the line after. Okay, so that gives you some encouragement that at least you're not hurting anybody, right? Okay, so then what do you do? <coughs> <laughs> All right. Now, it turns out these pre-lectures are served by our server, and we have clever programmers who can dig through the server logs and figure out how much time each student spent on the pre-lecture. So then you make a data point for every student, and you make a histogram of time spent on pre-lecture. And you see a distribution like this. So right here, where that arrow is, if you just watched it and didn't pause or do anything, that's how much time it would take, about there. So you see a peak at zero. All right, so these are students who kind of, ah, I don't want to do this crap. And they just kind of went to the slide, started it playing, dragged the little scrubber over, went to the next slide, started it playing, dragged the little scrubber over. So they can get through that whole pre-lecture in really like a minute. They don't, they're not participating, okay? So you make, you do a high energy physics thing. You make a cut. You take the data points to the left, okay? And you plot the performance of those students. And you take the data points on the right, and you make the same plot for those students. So we call these guys non-viewers. We call these guys viewers. Why not? OK? And so here you see, for the non-viewers, lo and behold, their performance on all these questions correlates perfectly with before. Right? Not surprising. They're not doing it now, so why should they be different than before? For the viewers now, it's even more pronounced. OK? So then you go, wow, this is pretty great. Uh, <coughs> Can I see, please, what happens to my strong students versus what happens to the weaker students? So then you wait till the end of the semester, and you take A students, B students, and C students out of here, and you plot this thing three times. So here's A students. So above the line, and, and the little insert shows you know, what it was before. Uh, so this should be right on the line there. And this is for B students, and this is for C students. So again, there's a lot of scatter on these points, but predominantly, you see things above the line. Okay, so that's an improvement. So then you're feeling pretty good about yourself. Okay, or at least I was. All right, now what made me feel even better about myself was this. So <clears throat> course difficulty. How do we measure course difficulty? We measure course difficulty by asking the students how difficult was the course. <laughs> no, I'm not, I mean, it's, it's a really good question because it tells you where the students' heads are at. And, um, and so we give them on a scale of very difficult, somewhat difficult, sort of neutral, pretty easy, really easy. And so if they answered very difficult or somewhat difficult, they would go into this category. So consistently, all through history essentially, students, 80% uh, of the students said it was very difficult or difficult. This is what it was after we made the change. Okay, we're covering actually more material now. The same questions as before, the same kind of exams. Nothing has changed other than we added the pre-lectures. Oh, sorry? Has it stayed a good question. Yes, I think so. I, I, good question. I, yeah, it would be pretty embarrassing if it jumped back up. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So students perceive the course as being, as not being as hard anymore because they come prepared. It's, you're not as confused if you thought about this stuff before lecture, right? It makes sense. Okay, so that, I just summarized that exact thing there. So then you can ask them some other questions in, that we have been for years. What's your attitude towards physics and towards this course? So not very many people had a positive attitude. It was typically around 40%, and it went way up. And it's the same people teaching, OK? So it's not a personality effect. And then this one is the greatest of all, because you would worry that since the students are now doing stuff before class, they don't value class anymore. How valuable is lecture? Very simple question. Uh, about less than half found it very valuable before, and now that doubles. Okay, so you have not diminished the value of lecture by making students prepare. You have made the value better. So this is great. So I, I, we were very excited about this. 
that's when we, you know, we, we're now doing this in all our, in both of these classes and we'll never go back. All right. So what's next? I have a few minutes left. I'm going to tell you about a gadget because I love gadgets. This is when I was doing particle physics. I, I love to build things. And so, uh, that's what we did. So uh, now I'm looking at the situation. Well, now what are we going to do? We, we fixed that problem. Uh, <clears throat> what's left? Well, I'm, we're feeling pretty good about the lecture. We're feeling pretty good about discussion. Uh, we're feeling pretty good about the labs and um, the homework and the exams, but we're not feeling so great about the labs. Especially since recently budget cuts and so on means that we, we have fewer labs, we have fewer lab TAs, our lab sections have more students in them. We have 32 students instead of 24. So students work in big groups on experiments um, a week or two after they see them in class sometimes. And, and I, I'm not convinced to get much out of it. And if you just look at them in the lab, they're sitting there, and some of them are working, and some of them are reading, and they just want to get done. Okay, so labs need work. All right, so here's the idea. Uh, and I would say that labs are typically underappreciated. I would claim even when the labs were better before budget cuts, I've never been seen really, really concrete evidence, other than really feeling it must be the case, that labs improve some sort of measure of anything. And so maybe uh, maybe we can improve that. Um, and so and, and part of the problem with labs is that the timing is rarely optimum, right? I mean, you, you have this aha moment in class or maybe before class with these pre-lectures, and then you don't get your hands on this stuff for a week. So maybe there's a way to improve this. And so here we go. Interactive online labs. Here's the big idea. You build a gadget, and I have the gadget with me. In fact, I have the next version of the gadget. looks even better. Uh, and the student buys these. You build them cheap. It's like a clicker. Uh, <clears throat> inside each of these things is, is equipment to do all sorts of labs. This thing communicates wirelessly with that thing. Okay? And so the computer the student has now, it's like a, a pre-lecture, but it, it has hands-on activity. So the computer will say, pick the thing up, throw it against the wall, put this, hook the spring on it, make a pendulum on it, spin it in the air, something like that. They see what's going on here. Um, and the system asks some questions, and, and it's, it's exactly like doing one of these pre-lectures. That's the idea. All right. Uh, now, imagine you can time it any way you want. Instead of having a two-hour lab a week later, maybe you could have two or three five-minute labs during the pre-lecture, before you even go to class. Right? Just play with the thing for five minutes. See that if you see this or see if you see that. Okay, you're done. Right? It's really fast. That's the idea. I'm, I, you know, we're still working on this, but that's my dream. Uh, and it's not a simulation. It's a thing. You hold it in your hand, and it, and it works. Um, so let me show you how it works. Uh oh. <laughs> Hope you just didn't turn them against me. All right. All right. So. Here is here's my device. I just plugged in. There was a little dongly thing here. I plugged it into the computer. Now this is blinking. It means they're communicating. This is a prototype. So if you come down and feel this, this is an SLA model. So it's rapid prototype. Uh, it's sort of weird plastic that was spray painted basically in the backyard, and so it, it doesn't look or smell or feel particularly nice yet. But it, it's you know it, it, once it's made nice, it'll it'll be very nice. Now the screen is kind of small. I hope this works. Let's go here. Click here to connect. Okay, kitchen sink. So all the things. There's a lot of stuff in this. Uh, right now, the only things I have working are about half of them, which you see here. There's accelerometer, magnetometer, gyroscope. There's a wheel encoder, a force probe, and a barometer. Okay, so I can show you all of these things. And the, the things that you can sort of do with this. Here we go. Let's start it off. Here we go. So that's the accelerometer, and it looks a little choppy. If I just set it on the table then suddenly what you see is that in the x and y acceleration, which is the horizontal plane is 0, and in the, the z direction, these lines are all 1g, the z direction has 1g of acceleration. Well, how is that possible? And it's not accelerating. Well, guess what? That's the equivalence principle. Okay? <laughs> Nature can't distinguish between acceleration and gravity. Well, that's gravity. All right? um, if I just throw this thing up in the air, let's see here. Well, that didn't work too good. Okay, now the battery jiggles loose. Okay, but anyways, it's a prototype. What can I tell you? But anyways, interesting. Okay, so you see here, 
while it was in the air, it was reading zero. Okay, That is why these accelerometers are so cheap. They're mass produced because there's one in every disk drive, there's one in every phone. There's, there used to be back in the day when things had hard drives, and most things still do, I guess. If the, if the hard drive in your computer ever saw this, it would go, holy crap, and park the heads. Because it would mean that the, 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 disk, the laptop was on its way to the floor. <laughs> right? And it would save your, your disk. So that's what would happen. I'm going to restart it here so that uh, I'm not going to throw it again. <laughs> OK. So that's the accelerometer. And let's do the kitchen sink again here. Let's, let's uh, do magnetometer. It's kind of cool. Uh-oh. Oh, dear. All right. Hang on a second. I think I need to turn it off and on again. This is what happens when the battery goes bye-bye. Like I said, brand new software on this. The, actually, the old model that you saw on the picture, we had a very, very advanced software on that. And we actually did tests with students. So this is, it's never a good idea to do a, a colloquium where you're showing something that's so new that nobody's seen it except for you, which is what you're seeing right now. OK, so let's hope it works this time. Start it off. There we go. OK, so now it's measuring a three, it's measuring magnetic field. And that's the Earth's magnetic field. And you can see it changing as I go like this. Um, and so it's kind of interesting. Uh, the x-axis is the red thing. And so you, anyways, you can see it's quite a big effect. There's hundreds of counts for just the very weak Earth's field. And so you can, you can have, oh dear, I did it again. <laughs> OK, anyways, you get the idea. So I'll, I'll just, uh, let me just fill it here. And we'll see if we can. I'll do it. I'll try one more thing, and then I won't wiggle it too much. Um, so it's actually sensitive enough that what you can do is uh, you can just have a, a wire next to it uh, with yeah, a with just a, a AAA battery, and you can measure the magnetic field from this one single strand with a with a current running it from a battery as a function of R, just by moving this thing back and forth. It's great. Um, if you hold it near the the speaker of the of the computer, you can make the thing go completely haywire. Yeah. Okay. Uh, gyroscope is kind of interesting. This is it's a it's a nano gyro in there, and so if I give this thing a spin, so I spun it around the z-axis. What you see right here, okay, if I make x and y go away, was I spun it up, and so this is omega z now, and then it constant deceleration back to zero. Okay, so constant torque, in other words, because it's just the friction of the thing spinning on the table, so you could figure out what, what the torque was. In fact, you could do the same thing with the accelerometer. Let's do, okay, I'm, I'm having way too much fun, but hopefully, <laughs> okay. So let's, let me take it very carefully over here and give it a shove. Oh, darn it, darn it, darn it. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, I'll stop now. Um, the, there's, a, there's a wheel on it. That no, okay, I gotta do one more. Sorry. Okay. I just have to, because this is too too cool for school. Okay. Uh, it's it's like thirty feet, I, but you know, right? It's I'm I'm obviously uh, struggling here. Uh, so this thing will. The hope is that we'll be able to make this for about thirty bucks. Okay. Hmm? Uh, well, that's a, I don't know yet. So hopefully, so we're, we're doing this. We're, we're, we're getting funded to do this by the same guys who we made that, that smart physics stuff with. So um, my hope is that they'll see this as a way that they want to sell it cheap, so as a kind of a way to, to promote the, the whole book thing. And so maybe it doesn't have to cost. Yeah, maybe they might not add too much to it. I don't know what the, the bookstore would add. Um, they usually add something. Right. Well, hopefully, no, they don't, that wouldn't work then. So here is a, uh, so now it's, this is rolling back and forth. There's a little wheel, okay? So the blue thing is displacement. The red thing is is uh, velocity. And so you can, if you feel like it, look at acceleration at the same time. Okay, and you can stop. Now <laughs> my software, synchronized cursors. Oh, it's going to work. Okay, so, yes. Yes, it has a bunch of stuff I, I can't show you yet. 
But here you can see that when the velocity is big, the acceleration, which is the up above there, so that's his maximum velocity. Uh, okay, right there, where the, the red thing is velocity, and uh, that's where the acceleration, which is the blue thing, crosses zero and so on. So everything works the way it's supposed to work, is my point. Uh, it, it's got a, um, now I'll quit while I'm ahead. Or, all right. So anyways, yeah, it's got a light meter in it. It has a barometer. It's actually extremely sensitive. I, I played around in the hotel this morning. You know, what else am I going to do? And I, I, um, I, I got this. I won't do it now, but just a trash bag. You throw this in the trash bag, and you, you blow in there and squeeze it a little bit. You, you can change the pressure by a lot. Okay, so you can do very sensitive experiments. So I, w I, I would imagine what I can do is put this in a, a container with a hole, blow over the hole, and see the pressure go down. It should be no problem at all. This is the same thing that they use for altimeters. So it's, you can take it in an elevator and go to the top of the building and see the pressure change. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and so it's got a buzzer and a microphone, so you can, you can send a certain frequency. You can receive it. You can digitize it at a very high rate, so you can do Doppler shifts. A um, bunch of other force probe didn't show you, but it... If there's a force probe in there, the measures plus. Hmm? Clicker? No. <laughs> yeah. Actually, yeah. Yeah, well, that's a good idea. It's got buttons. But it runs at a different frequency. This is 2.4 gigahertz. The clickers are 900 megahertz. All right. Um, so I'll, let me go back. And I, I think what I'll do is just stop there because I am out of time. And, um, and if anybody has any questions about, what I'm actually kind of hoping here is, I wanted to dangle something cool in front of you. So I know there's some nerds in the audience that are kind of like me and who would enjoy playing with stuff like this. And so we are pretty soon, actually in about a month, going to start developing content for this thing as, as the firmware and the software gets sorted out. Uh, we want to actually use this in our, in our classes. And I have a graduate student working on testing this. We've done a few tests with it already. We have a twos grant to evaluate this stuff. So there's real education research that we're going to do. So if anybody's interested, please talk to me. All right, I'm going to stop right there. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so exam performance is a good question. Um, the final exam performance improves a small amount, not much. The midterm exam improves significantly. I mean, by sort of a, by significant, I mean that the, the effect size is better than, you know, it's 0 0.01 that it's not a random effect if you do the statistics. I'm sorry, I don't have the slide. But it, the, the, given that the, you know, the, um, the concepts are what's stressed in lectures. So the conceptual questions that we showed you, all those little data points, really go up. And so one thing that we haven't done yet, and we should, is look at the conceptual exam questions. So I, I don't know if you break out conceptual exam questions versus numerical ones. I bet it has a, a, a much bigger effect on the conceptual ones. We haven't done that study. Uh, it helps a little. It doesn't help a lot. Oh, you, you point. <laughs> yes. I don't know. <laughs> Only you would know that. No, I, I, we have, I can maybe show you the literature. We actually did a, a published study on comparing how well you could grade someone's performance using multiple choice versus carefully hand graded and interviewing students and things like that. And we convinced ourselves it's the same. Now, the, and we, we have a scheme for giving partial credit and things like that. So we'll never go back. What we found, the reason for us is simple. We, we were more concerned about the unfairness of the other method than we were about the ickiness of the multiple choice method, if you want to call it that. And the, by unfairness, I mean we would, you, you've done this, you sit there, you grade exams for eight hours, and the student's grade depends on things like, did it arrive, you know, did the pizza come before or after you graded this person's exam, right? Or can I read their handwriting? Or things like that. And then because of the grading is uneven or on who graded it, then you have the possibility of regrades. So the students have to be able to come to you then and hand you the thing and say, well, I think my friend did this and I did the same thing. How come I didn't get a point? And then you always end up rewarding people who complain. And then if you find a problem with your exam, you can't fix everybody's exam. So we convinced ourselves, and it wasn't laziness, I assure you, um, that we we are more fair doing the multiple choice exams. We also ask the students, do you think the exams are fair? And they say, yes, we think the exams are fair. 
you ask the students, do you think the exam represents your knowledge of the course material, they go, oh no, I know much more than the exam shows I know. But that's always been the case. Okay. Oh, well, so I should say when we created our stuff, we st borrowed as much stuff from other people that we possibly could. So it, right, I mean, it, it's, it, the, the perfect scenario is that you take something from somebody else, hopefully from us, because then you'll make it better, and then we can benefit from what you do, okay? And so, but it's, there's no sense reinventing the wheel if you can start with something, and then you can make it your own by changing this, that, and the other, but you don't have to start with a completely blank slate. That's just way more work than you need to do. We didn't. Which, I'm sorry? Yeah, it was developed. Yes. Uh, it, it was. It's not now. So, so now the, the pre lectures and the checkpoint and, and uh, there's a whole infrastructure there, a whole course basically that we developed uh, with Freeman Publishing. So what we wanted to do is we, we knew we couldn't do this ourselves because we had to hire programmers to, to do it. And so the only way that they're going to say, yes, we're going to give you X, you know, tons of money to pay programmers is if then they can charge a bit of money at the end and get something back. And so we said, okay, that's fine, but only if you don't charge very much. And so that, that's the arrangement we've made with them. So now it's, you, can, you can buy it. The students get this. Yeah, right now it's, you can just use it. If you, smartphysics.com, you can just go look. Mm -hmm. Oh, in lecture. Okay, so it's 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 not complicated, or I mean, it's maybe not what is complicated as things. That we just I ask them a question, and then I I just say turn to your neighbors and talk about it, and and that's really it. And and and, and the students though they'll do that. In, in the, it's funny because in the past we we did that before we used clickers when we just you know had flashcards and all that kind of stuff, and it was a bit harder to get them excited about it. Right, right. But but I think it's it's basically they just sit. You know, the room is like this. It's not really conducive to group work. But if if this were a class, and you would turn around and maybe talk over there, and and you have a little group, and then you would argue. And if, and what we do is we give them, if they get it right, they get a, some bonus points that they can apply to offset poor uh, uh, quiz performance and things like that. So there there's a bit of motivation, just a little bit to get it right. Otherwise, they might just say, oh, the heck with it. I just want my, my point for participating. I don't care what I click, but just that one little point makes a huge difference. Right, so there are, we use the same questions every semester, but it's a lot. So but there are more questions that are available. So what we did, what we talked Freeman into doing, since they published Tipler, they made all the Tipler questions available that, so you can just stick them in and ask them to, like online with, in the same homework system. So there's way more questions there than we ask. Um, but we like the ones that we made better than the typical questions, just because we did research on on them and understand why students get certain things right and wrong, and we have hints built in and stuff like that. Um, it, it's a whole big topic, but that I, I won't. We can talk about afterwards if you want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, people still go to the board, and, and the, the, the purpose of 
having that, okay, this lecture goes with this PowerPoint is simply to define what has to happen in this lecture so that things don't get out of sequence in the course. So if you have some, if you hate PowerPoint and, and you want to do things a little differently, that's probably fine. I think what most people will do is the PowerPoints are pretty good it, you, and, and they contain mostly, and it's not lecturing anymore, it is really just a bunch of questions that are good questions. And so those are good to have there because if you're going to ask them of your students, it's easier to put it up there than to write on the board the questions. But if you've got a good question, you can write on the blackboard or what I have, I have one of those tablets at the front, so I, I write on the tablet and it's, it goes right into the, the computer file essentially and then I, it, it's saved. So I can post the stuff online and they can see everything I wrote. It's, they, they can't see it if I write it on the blackboard. Yes, yes, correct. Mm -hmm. Like longitudinal measures? No. The, I think the College of Engineering is now happy simply because their students are happy and they don't get complaints about physics anymore or much less. I mean, nobody can love it because it's a required course and the students see it as somewhat of an obstacle to them becoming engineers, right? And so nobody's going to go, oh boy, this is the greatest course. I mean, some people do, and then they switch majors and become physics majors. But, um, right. But one thing is very true, that the college definitely really likes that we've done this. And when they have people visiting campus and they want to haul out something, some educational reform that they're very proud of, they'll, they'll mention, they'll bring them to physics. So they, they like this. Um, we do, I mean, we do recruit engineers. We, there's some great undergrads in engineering. It's a fantastically smart people who then they'll minor in physics because they kind of like quantum or whatever it was. And then they'll go, hey, I kind of like physics. I mean, it happens. We also have physics majors who are in physics just because they want to get into engineering, right? And they will transfer out. So it's probably kind of, probably have more people transferring out than in. But I think that the ones that transfer out, they probably just leave I don't think they get into engineering. They just, you know, put them to I agree that we've really, we've improved what I feel is important to improve is, which is that the students feeling about the whole enterprise of the physics courses when they leave. And the reason I'm saying that is that I think some students, you know, we've all had really great classes and we've had a really horrible classes and we got through them and we learned about the same, right? And so there's some students that no matter what you do, they're just going to do great. And then there's some students I mean, the ones that you want to get to are the ones that are kind of on the fence and they're thinking, I don't know if this is really for me. I mean, there's a, there's a line somewhere where somebody is going to fall off and just leave or maybe give it another shot and stay. I think if you can make a positive motion across that line, which I think is largely a line of how you feel about this stuff, right? That's, that's where it's real important to me. Oh, this little thing. So we are getting... At the end of the month, I'll have 50 of these. Hopefully by the end of the month, I mean September, I'll have... Um, yeah. Next fall, there should be a lot of these. But before then, we need to, we got a lot of work to do. As you can tell, because I jiggle it and it stops. But that's just a battery terminal. Right. Yes. Um, well, same as always, right? They, 
they probably go on and live productive lives. So, I mean, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, <laughs> no, I, I mean, we don't punish them for that. And that was a conscious decision. It would have been very easy to force them to spend, you know, X amount of minutes on it. But then we figure it's just going to make them mad, and then they're going to find some other way to scam it. So why do that? And so really, they, they have every right to do that. And we see that on every lecture. And what I find is it's not always the same people. And sometimes maybe you know this stuff. And you, you're tired. You know, I'm this, I remember this from before. I'm not going to do it this time. And then when it gets a little harder, you see that go down. So I, it's, it's fine with me. I think it, some of the people have a legitimate reason for not spending a lot of time on it. And, and some probably don't. But I, I'm not going to try to distinguish between them. Uh, so, two questions. So, some of the stuff has been implemented in the higher level courses, and the reason I believe is that when we have a new assistant professor, like I said, we'll stick them in Physics 211 for a year or two, and then when they go on and teach, you know, advanced the E&M or something, they'll do checkpoint, or you know, they'll do the just-in-time teaching, or they'll 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 apply some of the stuff they learn. They don't have pre-lectures. But actually, sometimes they can. I mean, they, they can make students watch something before coming to class. They can create Jing slides or YouTube videos and things like that. People do stuff like that. So I think that having people in these courses first makes them appreciate the fact that you can do different things except and not just teach the way that you were taught. I mean, we all, the, the, the base way of doing it is just, okay, I'm going to lecture the way that I was lectured to when I was a student, and, and this is showing them something else. And then as far as the effect of our, on our majors, uh, I don't know. We it's, it's, so it's, oh, yeah, actually, so, yeah, so the, the, the effect on the people that are TAs is, is very positive. And so we, the, the training and the, um, some of our, we have fantastic teaching assistants, graduate students in our, in our department. And, and so I think for them, it's a very good thing to, to learn how to, how to teach better. And we have undergraduates who also get to TA especially the ones who are my advisees, which are the ones who are in the teaching, high school teaching minor. So they're physics majors, but they're going to be high school teachers. And so we can, if we can build them into the course at some point before they graduate, they tend to be really, really good, and it's, it's valuable experience for them. So yeah, I think teaching these classes is a great experience for a student. No, no, I, I, I hadn't thought about you know watching my back when I go to the hotel tonight, but uh, <laughs> I, uh, I don't, I don't really think so. I mean, in fact, the, this, the, the, the pre lectures are part of a big movement going on in, in education now. If it's the term is flipping the classroom, and it's, it's happening all over. It's not like we invented this. We just, I think we did a good job for our courses. But it, it's 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 happening, and you know, you go to the Khan Academy and look at that stuff. A lot of people would assign students to look at those things before they come to class, and then have a discussion. It's very common in high schools. I mean, the, the stuff that's out there, some of it isn't that great, but it's it's people are using it, and um, and so I, other publishers, I'm sure, will do what we do. I'm sure Pearson will have something soon, and why, you know. So I I don't think there's any going back. I don't think that um, you know, with, with Apple having textbooks on their iPad and stuff like that. People, they're just figuring out how to do this, and it's not going to turn around. Hmm. And one thing I should mention, there is accessibility issues with all this stuff. So just so you realize, there's, there's a closed captioning button on all these things, so you can see that's the beauty of recording something that you work very hard to make a script for first, is that it's very easy to do the closed captioning because you have the script. So that's already built in there. So we have no issue with, with that. Uh, you mean of the actual lecture, or do you mean? I haven't tried that. I mean, I, I you know, this, again, uh, we don't. That technology in our rooms isn't so easy to do. It, it, 
but it wouldn't be a bad idea. I haven't tried it. Okay, that's a, that's a, that's a really good idea, and and it's I think. That's a really good idea. Yes. Right. So it's what we do is we have, uh, so, so there's it, it's it's minimal training before the semester starts. So they they have a whole day training session with the Center of Teaching Excellence, which does a lot of this stuff. I mean, it it tells them how to interact better and things like that. And then what we do is, like I said, we have some excellent TAs already in these courses. So if you've taught in these courses before and, and we think you're excellent and we have a lot of these, then you've got to reduce teaching load and then your job is to be a mentor TA to the other TAs in the course. So now you go and sit in on all the other sections and you observe the other TAs who are your peers and then you you know kind of help them, give them pointers and stuff like that. So that, that mentoring process has been very successful for us to train the TAs. Yeah, so we use less faculty in lecture than I think you do, because even next semester when there's 12, 1,300 students in my class, there'll be two lectures. I'll do two, somebody else will do two. And, uh, and so then we have, you know, if we still want to use four or five faculty in the course, which we have the luxury to do, then those other extra two or three people can, can run the discussions and train the TAs and do things like that. So that's been very helpful, of course, to faculty. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, uh, Matt, again. Mm -hmm. mm. Great questions.